right. Man, um, this is one of my favorite messages, I think, that, that uh, we're going to hear. I, uh, I preached this message first time, I think maybe the only time, really, uh, back in May 15, 2011. I was 52 years old. Um, Jared and um, Courtney were going through some difficulties with Harper Kate and hearing some difficult news about things. I was in the with, with our special needs granddaughter, for those of you who don't know. And we were in a series called God's Not Mad at You. And uh, man, our church was growing in crazy ways. We put a banner on that highway, uh, 79, that said, God's Not Mad at You. And uh, man, I got calls and stuff from people trashing me for how could I? All these Christian people were asking me what I was thinking because you know God's God of judgment, and I was getting all that stuff. And then I was getting people walking through the doors going, "Hey, if you're going to tell me God's not mad at me, I need to hear it." And they were walking in the door, so we were getting it both ways, right? And um, and so it was in the middle of all of that. We were so we were walking. This is the fourth message in that probably 13 week series that we did. On God's not mad at you. And we were just shifting to talk about grace. And uh, that week, uh, we were getting bad news uh, about, about Harper Kate. It was my birthday week, but it was bad news that we were hearing about Harper Kate. And I remember diving into this story, and I was just enmeshed in it. And the Lord had me text Jared and Courtney um, this phrase, just like Mephibosheth, Harper Kate has a seat at the table. Now, if you've never heard that story, it ain't going to make sense to you. But I want you to understand something. If you're here today and you're breathing and you've repented of your sins, you have a seat at the table of the king. There is no better story on the planet to hear than this one. And it's my privilege to share it with you. If you've heard it before, pretend you haven't. And if you haven't heard it before, hang on. Because it is. we're we're in 2 Samuel Chapter 9. I'm going to give you a long intro and a short story, okay? So we're in, we're in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Let me give you an overview because we've been there. We've walked through the Judges. Actually, we walked through Jericho. I mean, uh, Joshua. Walked through Judges. Looked at Ruth. This is, this is where we've been. And the time of the king, I mean, of the Judges was where they were. And yet the nation's crying out, we don't want judges. We want a king like all the cool nations have. Please, God, give us a king. And God's like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of your king. I don't know if you know that or not. You're right. But, but since you want one, I'm, I'm going to give you one. And so they were crying for a king. Samuel the prophet appoints Saul as king over Israel. And they have a king. They got a mighty king. Saul was a head taller than everybody else in the land. I mean, he was like the giant of Israel in that sense. And so he's there. He's a Benjaminite, um, and and he's a warrior. Uh, God tells him early on in his kingdom, in his reign, he says, I want you to utterly destroy the Amalekites. Leave nothing to them. Destroy everything. He goes in there, he kills them, he leaves the king. He takes some of the some of the um, livestock with him, and he's heading back home. Samuel meets him and says, "What is this thing you've done against the Lord?" He said, "Man, we had a great victory. I've done nothing against the Lord." He said, "Did the Lord not tell you to uh, kill everything?" Yeah, I, I, I was faithful. I did that. And Samuel said, "What's the bleeding of sheep that I hear behind you? What what is that then?" Well, it was, these, were, these were good. This was the good stuff. I'm just bringing the good stuff to serve as king. And Samuel told Saul the days God's taken your kingdom from you. So Samuel's told to go and anoint David as king. Everybody doesn't know all this yet. Saul's still doing his thing. Saul's king, but he's paralyzed. He's sitting on one side of a valley and, and the Philistines are on the other side and there's this man named Goliath that comes down to the middle every morning to taunt the God of, of Israel, the, the God of the living. And he's taunting him. And Saul is petrified. This giant of a leader is just paralyzed. David, this little ruddy complexioned shepherd boy, 
runt of the litter in some sense, is told by his dad, hey, here's some cheese. I want you to take this, and I, and I want you to take it to your, your brothers that are at the battlefront. I want you to see how things are going, right? This is a dad going, hey, son, you got brothers over there. I'm a little concerned about what's happening. Here's some cheese. Go take it to them and see how they're doing. Now, there's a whole lot of story in that whole thing, too, how David starts out as just the carrier of the cheese and ends up the king of Israel, and, and a town is named is t- changed name, so it's now called the town of David, David's town, right? But that's a whole nother story. So David's just carrying the cheese, man. That's all he was doing. He's just a shepherd boy carrying the cheese. Goes and carries the cheese. His brother's like, what are you doing here? He's like, well, my dad said to check on you. You just came to see the battle. He's like, no, nah, I didn't know anything. But he hears Goliath down there taunting everybody. And he goes, what, what is going on? He's looking around like, what are y'all doing? Why are you letting this thing taunt the God that created us? And so they're saying, hey, whoever kills that man, King Saul is going to give his daughter to them in marriage. Now, David's probably 12, 13, 14, maybe 15 years old. He hears woman. He's at that age. He's like, wait, can you explain that deal to me one more time? You mean whoever goes down there and kills that sucker down there is going to get a wife? No questions asked. I got. I mean, is that's, is that's it. He says, "I'll be your man. I'll, I'll be that." And so they send him to Saul. You would think Saul, the giant of a leader, would look at him and go, "Man, if that guy's got courage, where's mine? I need to buckle up." But it didn't happen. So he tries to put his armor on David. It's a little clunky. David's like, look, man, I don't, I mean, it's like you ever had your five-year-old want to put on, you know, the big brother's helmet, right? And it's like it can spin it around and the pads are too big. This is what it must look like. It's like just this silly thing. And he's like, look, I, I appreciate that. But, man, I got these five stones and I got a sling. I think I got everything I need. If you just let me sling my sling, I think I'm good. Besides, hadn't God said these guys are ours? And so David grabs that sling of his after working the deal with Saul. He runs down there. And Goliath is taunting him. He says, man, I, have I got a stone for you? Right? Slings that sucker, knocks him down, kills him, and then cuts his head off. Right? We know that story. So Saul's pretty, you know, hey, cool. Until they're heading home. And it's just proud army because the Philistines, once they lost Goliath, they just began to skirt around. They began to head home. News had already traveled by the time they get there. And as they began to enter into the city, there's a song playing. Saul has slain his thousands. I'm sure he sat up a little higher on his horse when that was going on. Until the second line came. But David is ten thousands. Something turned in Saul. He became an angry king. And he knew what was coming. But he's going to try and kill David anyway. And the whole, I mean, half of David's life, he's been anointed king. Not officially yet, but he's anointed king, and he's king over nothing. He's on the run. He's, he's hiding out from, from Saul, who's intent on killing him. Saul's got a son named Jonathan, and Jonathan and David are tight. And Jonathan's like, man, I'm going to try and keep ahead of you. I'm going to try and tell you when Dad's planning on doing something to you, so you can, you can you know, be afraid and you can trust me. We're buds. And so Jonathan and David became closer friends than than David and Jonathan ever had in their whole life. It gets to be one time, David's hiding out, and Saul has to go to the restroom, and since in those days there were no restrooms, you just went someplace where you could do your stuff in private, and he walks into a cave where David's hiding out. Now you would think if you're David, and this man's been chasing you, you would go, God has answered my prayer. I mean, he's here. He's vulnerable. He's exposed. I can kill him right now. That's what most of us would be doing. I would think. I don't know. David cuts a little piece of Saul's robe off. And Saul goes on his never knowing anything. He goes down in the valley. Saul, uh, David steps out of that cave and hollers at him. He says, man, look, I could have killed you, but I didn't. I'm honoring you as king. Well, the story goes on. Jonathan and his brother and Saul are still fighting. 
They're fighting the Philistines still, right? They've engaged. The Philistines have regrouped. They're getting back at this thing. And he gets so thick in battle that Jonathan dies. Jonathan's brother dies. And Saul knows what's coming. Being a king in those days, you, you didn't want to get captured alive because it was brutal what they would do to you. So he tried to get his armor bearer to, to kill him. His armor bearer said, I'm not doing it. So, so Saul falls on his own sword. David's anointed king of Israel. He kicks the Jebusites out of Jerusalem. And he, 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 I mean, what, a, what a warrior he is. He fortifies the city and they rename it David's town because he had just captured Jerusalem, which the Jews had never held before. Now, fast forward 30 or 40 years. All right, you tracking with me? 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. Here's the story. Then David said, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul that I could show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Right? Listen, <laughs> he, he, he's an old warrior at this point. And he's sitting around thinking he's in the kingdom. He's sitting in whatever palace he had in those days. Most likely it was Saul's. And he's just, it's at ease at this point. And he's looking around and going, man, I love John. Right? What a great friendship. We, we had a friendship like no other. What if there's anybody in the house of Saul and Jonathan that I could just bless? Just because I miss my friend. Right? You read that? That's what it's saying? Yeah. Then David says, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul so that I could show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, before you read ahead, that word kindness, um, you, you can chase it all the way through the Scriptures and you will see more than it, m many times besides kindness, it is the word grace. It's, 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 it's this aspect of, of giving people, lavishing on somebody something that they in no way deserve, right? Hey, Saul's house deserves nothing. He's the one who is disobedient to God, right? But here's a king that goes, no, no, no. He, they, he, doesn't, uh, he's not, he doesn't deserve it. I'm not, I'm not giving him mercy. I'm giving him grace. I, I want to find somebody in the house of Jonathan and of Saul that I can just give grace to. This is, this is what it is. Now listen, don't miss this connection because we're going to find that we're in this story here. You don't think that, you, that God has lavished His grace on you? You don't think He lavished His grace on you when you were rebellious against Him? When you had chosen to side with the evil one as opposed to Him? And God's looking down through time and going, who, who can I show grace to? All right? Come on. Now, David is making good on an oath. I want to give you, we have to read, but this is why it's so important that you and me just study Scripture and we see things. Let me tell you what he had told to, to, uh, to, to Jonathan in 1 Samuel chapter 20. You don't need to turn there. I'm just telling you, well before this day of him sitting around in the castle mm -hmm. saying, is there somebody to bless? Here's what, Jonathan knows this battle's going to go wrong. Jonathan knows his dad's going to lose his life. And, and you know what happens when a king comes into power? You know what happens to the former king? Yeah. He dies. Every all his, He doesn't want anybody rising up, taking revenge from killing his, his, his dad. So everybody dies. And so Jonathan, knowing that's potentially coming, says this, verse 20 of 1 Samuel chapter 24. I mean, uh, uh, of 1 Samuel chapter 20. He says, if it pleases my father to do you harm. Right? So, man, if, if, if Saul ends up doing you harm, may the Lord do so to me and more so if I fail to inform you and send you away that you may go in safety. And may be the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. This is Jonathan trying to work a deal with his, with his best friend David, right? And then he says this, And if I'm still alive after, after my dad's gone, he says, and if I'm still alive, will you not show me the faithfulness of the Lord so that I don't die? Listen, I, I know what happens, David. He, and even though we're friends, man, if you kill Saul, I know you're going to want to kill me too. And you shall never cut off your loyalty to my house. Not even when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. 
Do you know what Jonathan is seeing? He's like a prophet here. He knows what's coming. He knows David's gonna gonna kick everybody that there is in the world out. And he's saying, I know it's coming, and I know, I know my days are number two. Verse 16 says, So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord demand it from the hands of David's enemies. And Jonathan made David bow again, again because of his love for him, because he loved him as he loved his own life. And so David's like, Hey, it's just like I love you as my own life. I'm, I will take care of your family. Right? Now, a few years later, he's having a conversation with Saul, the old king. 1 Samuel chapter 24. Now behold, this is Saul talking to David. Now behold, I know that you will certainly be king and the kingdom of Israel will be, will be established in your hand. I, I, I failed. I let people live. You're going to obliterate everybody. So now swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me and that you will not eliminate my name from my father's household. And David swore an oath to Saul. Then Saul went to his home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Now, David, you remember him, right? Adulterer, murderer. Yet God wasn't interested in beating David up over his sin, right? This is why this is so important that you need to hear this. God's not mad at you, right? He's not interested in beating you up over your sin. He just wants it gone. It's all he wants. He wants you whole again. You know the song we sing about creation, praising Him and all of that? Right? This is what He's saying. Hey, you were created to honor Me. You were created to bring Me pleasure and glory. And, and I, I want that from you. Right? Satan stole it. God's not mad at us. He simply wants to, us to belong. This is what He wants. He wants us to belong to Him, to be adopted by Him, to be accepted by Him. It's just a matter of you not of, of confessing your sin. That's all that's necessary. He just wants it gone. Grace is a demonstration of love that is undeserved, unearned, and unrepayable. Right? God's not asking you to clean anything up. God's not saying, if you clean up, if you clean yourself up, I might love you again. You, you clean yourself up, I might be gracious to you. He died for you and me before He even was going to give us any grace. He had a, I mean, he, he was, he, he was, before we, while we were still sinners, he died for us. Grace is not a demonstration of if you take the first step, then I'll lavish you. Grace is him taking all the steps and you just recognize it, right? That's really all it is. So grace is a demonstration of love that's undeserved. Because you're, you and me, we're dirty, rotten, stinking little sinners before Christ, right? And, and so I, I, didn't, I deserved everything I get. I deserved the wrath that is being stored up right now for the wicked. I deserved that. And by His grace, I got this barrier around me. So when that wrath unleashes, it's just going just gonna to divide and go around me. It ain't going to go through me. It won't destroy me. Why? Because grace. Did I deserve it? Absolutely not. Did I earn it? Man, I'm going to try and be good. If I try and be good, it, no, I, I didn't deserve it and I can't even earn it. And I can't even repay him for what he gave me. This is what's crazy. Now, let's get back to 2 Samuel. This is the good stuff. Then David said, right, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul so that I could show him my kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they summoned him to David and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? Now you, you would think there's a little freaking out that's going on here. right? You just get summoned to the king's house and you know that you are a servant of the former king. you got to think, I'm going to kiss my wife and my babies and all that now because I probably ain't coming back. Right? So he says this, Now there was a servant in the household of Saul named Ziba. And they summoned to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, I am your servant. Then the king said, Is there no one remaining of the house of Saul whom I could show kindness to God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan, one who is disabled in both feet. Listen, this is, a, this is another one of those crazy stories. But let's, let's go on. We'll come back to it. Listen, grace doesn't look for normal. It doesn't look for pretty. It doesn't look for good. 
Grace is just great. God's grace is not based upon any of those things, right? It's not. Grace doesn't look for someone that deserves it. He just looks for someone he can lavish on. Grace is a one-sided contract, and you and I need to know. And God's, listen, God's gracious to you. Can you just think about that for a minute? You didn't deserve a thing that God gave you. You deserve death. You and me, we deserve death. We deserve hell. That, that, that's what we deserve. And I was a dead man in my sins. Evil, wicked, running from him. And he called. Right? Bones. Just dead bones. And he called. This old body started rattling. And it came to life spiritually. And he, he lavished his grace on me. Ephesians chapter 1, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Where you've been accepted. You catch that? You've been accepted. On what basis? Grace. You've been adopted. He didn't just break, he didn't just say, hey, you can live in my kingdom. You can live in my house. Not just in my house. You have a seat at my table, which we ain't got to yet, right? So so he has adopted me. I, I'm I'm in the family. And he's lavished grace on me. And he's forgiven every sin I will ever commit. And he's deposited his Holy Spirit in me. And he has set heaven as my eternal home, while this one is my earthly home. This is who he is. Now, this is what it says in verse 4. So the king said to him, where, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is in the house of Mechar, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Now, Lodabar is an interesting place. The term means no pasture land. Basically what it means is it's just a desert. It's a, if you could appreciate this term, it, it's a hellhole in the desert in Palestine. You know why he's there? Because he's afraid, because he knows who he was. He's afraid that somebody's going to find out who he is and they're going to kill him. Here's this crippled man now who was five when he became crippled. And he's hiding out because he's fearful that David might find out that there's still somebody in the line in the house of Saul. So they just run to get as far away from the king as they can, right? How many of us have ever done that, right? Try to outrun God, right? And this is, this is what's going on here. So, this is what happened. In 2 Samuel chapter 4, don't turn, I'm just going to read, it's just one verse. Jonathan's dead. Saul is dead. Everybody finds out. They know what's happening. They know that David, most likely, is going to come, and he's going to kill them. And it says this, So Jonathan, Saul's son, who had a son who was disabled in both feet, he was five years old when the news of Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse picked him up and fled. But it happened that in a hurry, uh, to hurry, he they to flee, he fell and could no longer walk, and his name was Mephibosheth. That's who this story is all about. Now, here's this guy who's had a chance to run, to hide out. He's he's hoping just to be a blip on the radar and just live out his days. He's content with that. I would potentially think he's probably mad at his nurse because she was clumsy and dropped him. I would think she's, he's mad at David because David, you know, coming after him, right? I mean, he's just, I would assume there's going to be a lot of anger in there. I would believe he's thinking, hey, life's not fair. I didn't do this. I, I, my dad was king. My grandfather was king. My, my dad didn't even get a chance to be king. Life's not fair. I didn't ask to be dropped. I didn't ask for all this to happen. And so there's just this, there's just this state of like, hey, this just feels unfair. Now let's get back to our story. Verse 5. Then King David sent messengers who brought him from the house of Mecher, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. It's a knock on the door, right? Soldiers knocking on the door. 
Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, fell on his face, prostrated himself, and David said, Mephibosheth? And he says, here's your servant, right? I, man, he's just like, it's coming. He's just waiting on the axe. He, this is the day he had been dreading. This is the day he'd been hiding out from. Now he's here. He's just, he's just okay, whatever, right? I mean, it's like, hey, I, I got nothing. So here's where we are. And it says this. And David said Mephibosheth and said, here is my servant. Verse 7. Then David said to him, for I will assuredly show grace to you. Your Bible says kindness. It really should say grace. Hey, bro, don't, don't be afraid. This is a good day. I will assuredly show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore you all the land of your grandfather, Saul. And you yourself shall eat at my table regularly. Again, he prostrated himself and said, What is your servant that you should be concerned about a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, Everything that belonged to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. This is Ziba. He remember what it's like. He ruled the whole place. And then it's gone. They're, they've run. They're hiding out in the desert. And you can't run from God's grace. You just can't do it. And so there he is, hiding out, thinking all hell was broken loose on him and he's living in a hell hole. <laughs> and, and the king thinks about it. Isn't that good? I mean, you got to catch this story because this is us, Right? We, is that not the story of us? Here we are, way over here, right? Didn't never leave the one behind, right? And so, create a universe. He created you. He created. We, that's why we sing that song, right? You're not just you're not just a blip on there. You are woven into creation, flawed as you and me are, right? That was why I text Courtney and Jared about Harper King. Hey, here's what I know. That little fragile brain dysfunctioned girl has a seat at the table just like I do. Right? I mean, you know, when people try to say that, you know, what's wrong with her, I'm like, nothing. She's just like God wanted her. Well, I know God wants her whole and healthy. Really? Well, where do we find that in Scripture? And what is whole and healthy to you? Right? Maybe your version of whole and healthy isn't the same as God's whole and healthy, and you can appreciate that, can't you? Are they not every bit the much of creation that we are? Aren't they? Does it, I mean, right? Do we, do we catch this? I just we have to see this because it affects how we see the world. We can't afford to stand and look high and mighty at everybody else. Listen, but for the grace of God, you ever heard that term? But for the grace of God, there go I. You better let that sink in. Because you might find yourself on the other end of what it feels like to have that grace just held back just a little bit. Right? So let's be this. This is, this is a powerful story here. Now, this is what it says. I'll look at it. Uh, verse 11, Then Ziba said to the king, In accordance with everything my lord the king commands his servant, so the servant will do. So he said, Listen, I want you to understand something. I'm going to give you all the land that I took from Saul and all the land I took from Jonathan. Zib, I'm going to trust you. you're going to do right by it. And you're going, to, you're going to now be the servant of Mephibosheth, that crippled man that you've been serving for 30, 40 years. And you're going, to, you're going to now plant his vineyards. You're going to plant his homestead. You're going to take care of that stuff and steward it because it belongs to Mephibosheth. But listen, he's going to be eating regularly at my table. All right, I mean, You don't have to worry about feeding him because he has a seat at my table. <laughs> so Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he ate at the king's table regularly and he was disabled in his two feet. Isn't it amazing how he had... He just wants us to remember something. He's disabled in his two feet. Now, 
Can we just talk about that table for a minute? There's a lot of wives there because David had a few. Amnon, his oldest son, mighty warrior, sitting probably at his right. Solomon's probably coming out of his library to come sit and eat dinner because all he did was study and learn. Why? Because he's the wisest man that ever lived, right? Tamar, this gorgeous babe that uh, was his daughter, she's sitting at this table. And no doubt, all of his great leaders of, of his army and everything else. Samuel, no doubt, is sitting at that table too. They're all sitting at this table. <laughs> and in comes every meal, this little, this little cripple, right? He, he's got the same seat that every other one does. Amen. Are you hearing this? Hey, listen, you and me, we have a seat at that table, don't we? Amen. Isn't there going to be a great feast one day when we get there? Amen. And, and then there's going to be some, some wine that's flowing, and aren't we all going to be sitting alongside of Paul and Peter and David and, and Esther and, and Rahab, right? I mean, this is it. You gotta let this, you gotta let this know. Listen, here's what I do know. We've all been dropped, right? I mean, think about it. We're all broken, aren't we? There's no one more whole than the other here. It's important that we know that, right? This is one of the greatest stories you're ever gonna hear. Because it's a reminder that God's grace flows everywhere and it knows no limits and it's a powerful story so since i brought harper kate up at the first can i tell you what text i got yesterday from harper kate so harper kate's 12 now and uh she goes to school she still can't eat she can't talk she can't walk she can kind of roll over uh, but they have this screen on her uh chair and it's got pictures on it and so when her eye locks in on it for like five seconds eight seconds then it will recognize that that's what she's trying to say so her body doesn't function but she can get her eye to look at a certain block and then it will the, this uh, pad will speak out whatever word it was she said so if she'll if she wants to tell her mother to leave <laughs> that word's on there and like mom go away right because uh, she's 12 and, and so she can do those things so all of her teachers names are in that same thing too so Jared picked her up yesterday from school, and the teacher's aide or, or had been picking her up. The teacher's aide uh, said this, and this is what he texts us. She said, I was feeling down and out uh, when I met Harper Kate. She said, I think Harper Kate realized it and told her through the screen, good morning. I'm Harper Kate. I'm 12 years old. He said, and then I think she could see uh, this this attendant said, I, I could see that she just saw that I was really, really struggling. And she said a few minutes later, Harper Kate calls her name because her name's written on there. So Harper, and she has to flip these slides to get to all of this stuff, right? So it's like it's like a, a PowerPoint. You have to move them out of the way so you can get to the one she wants to. So she gets all the way and finds this lady's name. And so it calls it out. And then she goes to the one that says this, hey. So she calls her name and then she says, I love Jesus. I'm thinking, here is this <laughs> crippled little girl that was born to our family as flawed as could be, and she's doing stuff like that in a public school in Peachtree City. I'm just telling you, this is God's grace, right? And you and me are the same way. I just, I mean, it's just, it's just hard to fathom everything that goes on in this. And so I want you, if you don't hear anything else, I want you to understand, listen, no matter what kind, it doesn't matter the crap. I'm going to speak plainly. It's in your life. It was in your life. It doesn't matter how far away from God you were. None of that matters. God isn't piling. That wrath is being piled up. And why is it not unleashed yet? Because He's a gracious God. He's not slow. He's just not willing that any should perish. What is that telling you? He's not mad at you. He just wants you to get your sin gone. He even sent His Son to do it. He graced you with that. You couldn't do it. And so He did it for you. And all you have to do is confess and agree with Him. And cry out Him and ask Him for forgiveness. And He says, when you do that, I'll unleash My grace. And I want you to know something. You have a seat at My table. From now through all eternity. There's no better story outside the Gospel in the New Testament of the story of Mephibosheth. And uh, man, I'm grateful for the opportunity to 
to share that with you today. Uh, now we're going to sing this one and we're going to 